just a bit of review and talking about what the major themes are from this chapter, the major types of things that we've done, how everything kind of fits together, and all of that. So, there have been three major kind of areas or types of problems that we've talked about. We've talked about graphing, we've talked about simplifying, and we've talked about solving. All of the kind of the skills and individual types of problems we've talked about this chapter have all kind of fallen into those three categories. So, when we talk about graphing, there were three important pieces of information that we needed to use to do this. So that they were the three forms that we can write our quadratic function in. And then the way that we find our vertex in each of those three forms. So we had standard form, we had vertex form, and then we had intercept form. Now, this information is not something I'd expect you to have memorized, so I would, I'll give you this information on the test, but you do need to know what the letters mean, how to use this, because this is going to be kind of the form that it'll look like. Yeah, Chloe? Can you repeat what the Sure, so it's standard form, vertex form, and intercept form. You're welcome. So when we talked about simplifying, what we're talking about is moving back and forth between these two forms, or these three forms. And operations on complex numbers, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. And then for solving, we've talked about three ways of solving. We've solved with factoring. We've solved with, uh, or solved directly. And then we've used the quadratic formula. So this is kind of the summary of chapter three, kind of in one place, all at once, kind of summarizing the topics that we've talked about, 
the sorts of things that we're responsible for come test time. Um, let's maybe spend a few minutes here and kind of go through how to do some specific problems kind of from each of these sections. Annalise? It says with a square root. So I just scribbled some notation there in case anybody was confused at what we meant by directly. But that's the one we're at, the square root both sides. Uh, Andrew? Quadratic formula? I just wrote quad formula. And the Q is, I guess, kind of not the best Q that's ever been written. Um, where would you guys like to start? We can start kind of at any place we want. There's no reason these need to be done in any particular order. Is there a topic on here we feel particularly rusty or not great about, Chloe? Okay. Sure. So I might ask something like this. I might say convert 2 times x minus 3 squared plus 1 to standard form. So what form is this problem currently in? What is, what is this? Yeah, this looks like vertex form, right? So if I go back to my little table here, to go from vertex form to standard form, I do expanding. So what does that look like? Basically what it says is I'm going to rewrite x minus 3 squared as x minus 3 times x minus 3. Once I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and multiply these two sets of parentheses together first. And the way I multiply these two sets of parentheses together is called foiling. So when I multiply x times x, I get x squared. x times negative 3 is negative 3x. Negative 3 times x is negative 3. And negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. And then I recopied the times 2 that was out front and the plus 1 that was at the end. So I notice inside that set of parentheses I can combine negative 3x and negative 3x to make negative 6x. And then just distribute that to and then my last step would to be combine my like terms of eighteen and one. And there is my standard form polynomial. Okay with that? Yeah, so let's do another example because there's lots of different directions we can go, right? So if I look at this little table, there are one step kind of problems that I could ask you to do like that one. And there's two-step problems I could ask you to do where I have to go from one end to the other end. So let's see what it would look like if I wanted to go from intercept form to vertex form. So 
let's say we were asked to convert x plus 3 times x minus 1 to vertex form. So if you look at this, this should scream intercept form to you. So if I go back up to my little chart here, I see that we're going to be starting at intercept form. And there's no direct route to go to vertex form, so I'm going to have to do two steps. I'm going to have to FOIL first to get it into standard form, and then I'm going to have to do completing the square to get it to vertex form. Okay, that's fine. We have a plan now. So the first part or the first step would be to foil this out. So when we talk about foiling, x times x, x times negative 1, 3 times x, 3 times negative 1. I notice there are like terms there in the middle that I can combine. Negative x plus 3x is positive 2x. Grace? Bless you. So we're in standard form, so now we can proceed to try to convert this to vertex form by starting the completing the square process. The first step in that process is to make the leading coefficient equal to 1, and I'm done, right? Notice that I have just an x squared there, so the leading coefficient is already 1. The next step would be to move the constant term to the other side. So I'll add 3 to both sides. The next step is to add b over 2 squared to both sides. So what number is my b in this case? It's the coefficient on the x is what we mean by b. So notice that 2 over 2 is 1, and 1 squared is just 1. But over here at this spot, I'm going to leave it like this. I'm going to write that instead of just writing it as 1. I'm going to keep it as something squared. The reason is it's a little bit easier to see how I factor that right-hand side if I leave it as something squared. So the next step is to factor. That's 1 in parentheses squared. So how does that factor? Well, it's going to factor to be something plus something all squared, right? What does the first something come from? The x squared. What does the second something come from? The 1 squared. So we ignore the squared part, and that's now factored correctly. My last step then would be to get the y by itself. 
So for this problem, we just subtract 4 from both sides. And we're all finished. Trace. So if I factored out x plus 1 squared, that's x plus 1 times x plus 1. So when I FOIL this out, I get x squared plus x plus x plus 1, or x squared plus 2x plus 1. So the 2x gets absorbed up into that factored form. What do you mean, what happened to it? Yeah, I mean, it's in there, right? This is the same as this, which is the same as this, which is the same as this, right? It's part of that x plus 1 quantity squared. Just keep in mind that this is not the same thing as x squared plus 1 squared, which is why you're confused. Exponents never, ever, 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 ever distribute. So that parenthesis with the x plus 1 inside it squared isn't the same as x squared plus 1 squared. So the 2x is in there, it's just in a factored form. What are you talking? What color of writing are you talking about? So you're talking about this piece here. It's x squared plus x plus x plus one. It's just me foiling out the line above it. You're welcome, Chloe. So we move the constant term to the other side, so the part with no variable attached to it. That's what we did second. You're welcome. Um, and this is, that's as hard as those problems can get, right? Is where you have to do two steps at one time. And this direction where you have to do the completing the square is obviously the hardest direction, right? That's the most complicated of those little subroutines on that little diagram is to have to do the completing the square part. The other ones you guys should hopefully feel reasonably comfortable with, right? Factoring and foiling and expanding, none of those are tremendously difficult skills. Um, as opposed to completing the square, which takes a little bit of pencil lead to kind of write that all out. Um, do we feel kind of satisfied seeing some examples inside this area? And the kinds, and these are. I think equivalent to the hardest kind of thing I would ask you to do on the test, this problem that we just got done, would be nothing any harder than that for this kind of problem anyways. Okay. Notice that completing the square here wasn't terrible, like we didn't end up running into a lot of fractions, nothing weird kind of happened, it was pretty straightforward as far as a completing the square problem could go. So I wouldn't ask you to do, like, the worst version of this kind of a problem on the test. That's maybe asking too much. But you should be able to do it, especially in a setting where the numbers are convenient, right? We didn't get any fractions or anything in here to make it too terrible. Um, what area would you like to talk about next? I mean, we can continue talking about this area if you want to, but I feel like at this point we've done kind of a lot here, and I don't want to spend all the time in just one area. But if you guys are still not happy with this, we can spe certainly spend more time here. Just looking for a little bit of direction from you guys. Whatever you feel like you want to spend some time talking about some more, reviewing some more that you didn't feel great about, this is the time to do that as we're wrapping things up and kind of bringing all these topics back together in one place again. 
yeah, absolutely. We can talk about some graphing. How to find a vertex? Sure. That's because we need to do that as part of a graphing problem anyway, so that's convenient. Okay? Okay, so let's say we have y equals 2x squared plus 12x plus 9. And we'd like to graph this. The first thing I want to do is identify what form this equation is in. What form is this equation in? Standard form. Now, I'm, again, I'm going to write, I'll have that information on the test, but God knows you should be able to look at this thing and tell what it looks like, right? Okay. So in standard form, I know the x-coordinate of the vertex can be found by calculating negative b over 2a. So let's real quick just run through what our values for a, b, and c are here, just so nobody's confused. What's my value for a? What's my value for B? 12. And what's my value for C? 9. Now, what happens if the x squared is written last? Does that mean that the coefficient on the x squared would be the C? Like if we had written it this way, does that mean C is now 2? No. Right? The A, B, and C are specific to what they're in front of, not the order in which we write them. Okay? So the A is always the coefficient on X squared, the B is always the coefficient on X, and the C is always the coefficient on the, or, or the constant term. What happens if you're missing one? What if it was just like 2X squared plus 9? then B is zero. Exactly. Good. Everybody feel okay with that? Those are just kind of an aside, but they feel like those are common mistakes or places where, like, what to do isn't difficult, but it probably just needs to be spelt out one more time. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug this in. So B is 12, and A is 2. So 2 times 2 is 4. And negative 12 divided by 4 is negative 3. Everybody okay there? Okay. To find the y-coordinate of the vertex then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my answer and I'm going to plug it in to the original equation for the x's. So 2 and instead of the x, I'm going to write negative 3, but it still has the squared. And I'm going to write plus 12. And instead of the x, I'm going to write negative 3. And then I'm going to write the plus 9. So I copy down the exact same thing as the equation above. I just, everywhere there was an x, I wrote a negative 3. So now all I have to do is compute this. Let's use our calculator to do that, because that's going to be a reasonably big number. So when I type this into my calculator, I need to make sure I type it in that looks exactly like the way I wrote it on my sheet of paper. So I'll do 2, and then I'll put parentheses, negative 3, and then my squared, and then plus... 12, parenthesis negative 3, plus 9. I'll go ahead and press enter, and I get negative 9 for that. Everybody okay there? The place where most students would make their mistake on here is typing the negative 3 squared into our calculator and not putting a parenthesis around the negative 3. 
So remember on your calculator, negative 3 and then squaring it is going to give you not what you mean. What you mean to type is this, which would be positive 9 as opposed to negative 3 squared, which squares and then makes negative. You want to make negative and then square. So here we get negative 9. So that's my vertex, is that point negative 3, negative 9. So I'm going to put that into an XY table. Whereabouts in your XY table should the vertex go? In the middle, yeah. In the case, case of making a five-point table, we'll put it as the third one. Now we have the freedom to choose any X's we want within reason. I should pick two X's that are less than negative 3 and two X's that are bigger than negative 3. It doesn't matter which X's you pick that fit that criteria, but come on folks, don't be silly. Pick sensible X's. Negative 3 Those are the X's that I would pick. Don't be silly, just pick them right in a row. That makes life as easy as it can. Now, how am I going to find these Y coordinates? Yeah, the same way I found the Y coordinate for the vertex, I'm just going to plug the X coordinate into the Y spot. So for the first X value of negative 5, I'm just going to replace all the X's in my original equation with negative 5's. And again, I'll use my calculator to do this because it's a little bit complicated. Just as a heads up for you guys with your calculators. That was a weird way of saying that, calculator. Um, if you press the second button and then enter, it'll recover the last thing you typed in. So you can just go back and edit it. So like, I can just go back and change the threes to fives. And if I do it again, press second and enter, I can just go back and change those fives to fours. That's a nice little convenient little shortcut that might make your life a little bit easier. So for negative five, I got negative one. For negative four, I got negative seven. I could go ahead and type this in for negative two and negative one. But I should know what those y values are going to be. What should the y value for negative 2 be? It should also be negative 7. And the y value for negative 1 should be also negative 1. The reason that works is, if I notice, in my x values, everything is going up by one unit. If I've chosen my x's that way so that the change in x is the same on both sides of the vertex, the ends of my table should be the same and the other points on either side of my vertex should be the same. Okay. Now if you picked your x in such a way that the change between the x's isn't the same on both sides of the table, that property won't happen, but it's unlikely that you'd want to do that or would actually do that. You'd have to get something weird like a vertex whose x-coordinate is two-thirds or something. Everybody happy with this? And from here, we would just plot points and draw the graph, right? You want to see graphing in some of the other forms, Nick? Uh, no. Okay. Does anyone else? Does that help kind of refresh our memory on how to do things, Chloe? Mm -hmm. um, like, how would you find the vertex? Would yeah. Let's do a vertex form one real quick then. So 
again, hopefully you can look at this pretty quickly and recognize this is vertex form. So in vertex form, the vertex is just the point h comma k. When we say h and k, what we really mean is if I think about the vertex form, the h and k are these coefficients. So what is our value for h in this problem? It's not 7, negative 7. Why is it negative as opposed to positive? Notice in our formula, it's a subtraction symbol here. In our problem, it's an addition symbol. But I know I can write addition as minus a negative. So now the negative signs match in the two formulas, but that means that the h is actually negative 7. What is the k value going to be? Negative 5. So our vertex is just negative 7, comma, negative 5. Okay. So if we were going to graph this, there's two good ways to do this. We could do this using a, our transformations of functions method that we had talked about for the first two chapters. Or you could do the same thing we did for the previous problem and just pick some values for x and find the corresponding values for y. Let's just do that. That seems pretty reasonable. So what values of x would you like to pick here? Those are the ones that I would pick. And then to find their y-coordinate, we're just going to plug them back in. I forgot what I called that coefficient, negative 3. Okay. So I have negative 3, and then in place of x, I'll write negative 9 plus 7 squared minus 5. And I get negative 17. And I know that what other value should be negative 17? The one for negative 5. And if I do the same thing then with negative 8 for x, so I'll just go back and edit that and make that an 8, I get negative 8. That's a coincidence. And then you can just plot your points and draw your graph. Okay. Just as a reminder, what shape should our graphs of quadratics be? Yep. So the shape is called a parabola. It should look like a U that either opens up or opens down. It should not be opening left or right. Why not? Those aren't functions anymore. If we're talking about quadratic functions, those are not quadratic functions because it would fail a vertical line test. Exactly right. Now, those are still parabolas, and you could certainly write an equation to have a parabola that opens left or right, but that's not what we're talking about right now. Okay. Feel a bit better about graphing? Good. What else do we want to talk about? I think we haven't talked yet about solving things or operations on complex numbers. If either of those sound appealing to you. We've just been spending a lot of time talking about solving, so I understand if you're not, if you feel better about that than the other things. And we just talked about complex numbers, although we didn't do any homework on operations of complex numbers yet. Grace? That's okay. This is the time to ask the ask your questions. So. So that's what we started with doing, and then we transitioned to do, we did some graphing examples. Exactly, yes. Yep. So the first two examples we did were examples of that. Okay. 
So it's just going to be a two-step process. Well, you're going to have to do two of them. So let's just look at this. Let's do an example. So you asked to go from vertex form to intercept form? Oh, we did that already. Oh, okay. To do that, what we did was we first went from here. I went from intercept to standard form by foiling. Right? If we look at this step here, we're in standard form, right? And after that, I went from standard form to vertex form by completing the square. Does that make sense? You're welcome. So if you have to go from one end of the table to the other, you need to take two steps, is basically what it comes down to. Okay. Uh, what else would you guys like to talk about? We have some more time here a bit. I'm not really positive how much more time, because I don't have any idea when this class is start or end anymore, because of the altered schedule today. So I'm just guessing that we have more time. I don't hear anyone in the hallway, though, so I think it's a safe bet that we still have some more time. Okay, about 10 more minutes then. Great. Chloe? Um, yeah, do you want to, let's talk about some solving ones. Okay. So first things first, if you're solving, what can you always do? Always use the quadratic form, right? Now, some of the times that's going to be really inconvenient, and some of the times there just might be something that be medium inconvenient, and some of the times that might be the best route to go, but it'll always work. Um, but let's, the biggest thing I want you to kind of take away on these solving situations is being able to effectively pick the method that's going to make the problem the easiest for you in the long or in the the easiest for you. So if I look at this problem here, I notice that the leading coefficient is 1. So if it's factorable, it's going to be an easy problem to factor. So I'm going to start by checking to see if I can factor this quickly. If I don't see the answer to the factoring question of multiplies to give me and adds to give me in like say 15 seconds, I'll probably just move on to the quadratic formula because I know that's going to work. Do we see anything that's going to, yeah, multiply to give us 18 and add to give us 11 is 9 and 2. And since the leading coefficient is 1, we can go straight to the factored form x plus 9 and x plus 2. I can then apply the zero product property to set each of these equal to zero. And I can solve each of them independently. So I get two answers of negative 9 and negative 2. Is there a good way for you to check this kind of a problem on the test? Use your program to see what the answer is supposed to be, right? Now, an answer with no work is not going to be satisfactory. That's not going to give you full credit or really much credit on a problem. But it'll certainly tell you if you've made a mistake somewhere along the way, like if you factored and you found the wrong two numbers, you'll certainly catch that mistake here. Okay with that? Let's do another. Let's just kind of do a, a nice spattering of them. Okay?
So what would you guys want to do first here? Can we tell what we'd want to do? Yeah, let's, we probably want to move everything onto one side before we make a decision about which technique we want to use because we don't even really know what this equation looks like for sure. So x minus x is 0 and 10 plus a negative 5 is positive 5. So I have 4x squared plus 5 equals 0. What would be the easiest method to solve this? Notice that I'm missing a plain x term. In those situations, I think solving directly is going to be the fastest method to do this. Now, you could certainly use the quadratic formula here. What would you have to put as the value for b? 0, but it will work. It's a bit of overkill, but it would work. I'm just going to solve this directly. So I'll just subtract 4 from both sides. Divide both sides. I meant to subtract 5 from both sides. And then divide both sides by 4. I'm just going to leave negative 5 fourths as a fraction. You are free to do that. In fact, I prefer answers as improper fractions as, as opposed to anything else. So don't feel the need to like turn it into a mixed number or a decimal. Just leave it as improper fraction. But we're not done here, right? What do we still need to do? Excellent. So we need to square root both sides. When we square root both sides of an equation, what do we have to remember? Oh. Oh. Guys, plus or minus. So again, whenever we square root both sides of an equation, that generates a plus or minus. Please don't forget to do that. It's an easy thing to forget to do, and I have to take points off for it. But you guys should know better than that. We've said it a bunch of times. Let's say it again once more all together. Whenever you square root both sides of an equation, you need a plus or minus. Okay, try not to forget. All right, so let's now worry about taking the square root of negative 5 fourths. First things first, when I square root a negative, what am I going to get? An i. Everybody agree with that? So... Putting the i out front gets rid of the negative sign underneath the square root. To explain why that happens, is I can rewrite this as square root negative 1 times square root of 5 fourths, and the square root of negative 1 is just i. How do I square root a fraction? Yeah, you square root the top and you square root the bottom. Now, the square root of 5 doesn't come out to be a clean number, so I'm just going to leave it as the square root of 5. But the square root of 4 is just 2. So if I really wanted to, probably the way that would be most common to write this would be this way. Are you okay with that? Um, let's do another. Is that enough? Okay. What if I have something like this? This is kind of the worst case scenario. What would I have to do to do this problem? Can I solve this directly? 
No. The reason we have an issue is because I have x's that are not all in the same place, right? I have x's inside that parenthesis and x's outside. So what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to expand that out. In the interest of time, because I know we're almost out of time here looking at the clock, I'm going to do all that expanding in my head just so that we don't run out of time here. You can check that on your own. Oops. And you should because that's not supposed to be 9, that's supposed to be 18. All right. Now it's over. Okay. And we'll move it all onto one side. And here, does this factor? Heck, I don't know, but if it does, it's going to be the long method. I don't want to do that. What will I do instead? Quadratic formula. Make sure you guys check this weekend for Power School. The review will be up. The review will be up. We'll talk about the test next time. Okay.